Both ESPN and NBC have Toronto falling off to be a bottom-feeding number 25 ranked team in their off-season power ranking. Me personally, I wouldn't take this level of disrespect. That disrespectful ranking was solely because of Fred Van Vliet being replaced by eventual Noah Lyles world champion Dennis Schroeder. While Freddie led the league in deflections and was a high volume scorer, he played a part in the vibes falling off and shot the lowest field goal percentage among 19 point per game scores. On the other hand, Dennis is better than people are making him out to be. Not only is he a Noah Lyles MVP, but in the last 5 minutes of games within 5 points, next to Jokic, Durant, Embiid, and Adebayo, this man was 10th in plus minus. Then in the postseason, he ranked number 1 in defensive rating. Schroeder's lob passing, speed, and clutchness complement two-time All-NBA player definitive face of the franchise in Siakam an MIP contender this upcoming season in Barnes, a second team all defensive player in Ananobi, a sixth man of the year candidate in Trent Jr., and springy role men who are drop coverage capable defenders up front in Pirtle, Boucher, Achua, and Coloco. With this squad being ranked so low, it shows the ignorance from the mainstream to predict Toronto's going to fall off to the bottom of the standings, disrespect providing the raps with something to prove. Stay tuned. But if you vibe with hoop highlights and commentary, subscribe and splash thumbs up for more vids. For NBA player mixtapes, follow at DFlowHoops on Instagram. I'm also on Twitter at DFlowHoops. Comment or shout out for today's vid is Haywood makes me laugh. Appreciate every take down below. Back to the vid. Masai Ujiri has received a ton of criticism from Raptor fans over the past few years for not making it clear whether the squad's rebuilding or trying to contend. This makes them tough to predict but the front office has made the right move 95% of the time. But it's a fact that Toronto has a ton of quality assets considering they've been in trade talks for the NBA's most picky superstar. Toronto may have overtaken Miami as the most likely destination for Dame. What experts have failed to consider is that off-court chemistry was the only problem this past season, and for 23-24, the Raptors won't have the head coach in charge of that chemistry, along with the team's most important voice during the implosion, Instead of getting the best shot possible in clutch moments, like a winner go home play in tournament game where the Raps were down 3 with only under a minute and 30 left, Fred opted to play hero ball, immediately chucking up a deep 3 after crossing half. During the season, when asked about a potential contract extension in Toronto, Van Vliet said the front office never made an offer. I was never, <clears throat> excuse me, I was never made a formal offer. Um, I think we all understand what comes with the contract extension due to the CBA if you understand how the cap works and, and how the contracts work. Weird part about that is, on a summer podcast, he stated the exact opposite. You know you were going to leave Toronto, that going back was no, not a part of the no, conversation. No, not at all. I mean, obviously I signed two years ago. They, they offered me an extension at the beginning of the season. I decided not to take the extension just to enter free agency and you know kind of see what the market was but I never really even thought about leaving until probably like a week ago. Putting Fred's drama in the past where it belongs and given the turmoil last year this gives a completely new coaching staff led by Darko a major rehabilitation process to make in the locker room. Van Vliet and Siakam blaming the youngins when winnable games started to slip away wasn't rooted in a team-based mentality. However, having added a just turned 30 year old in Dennis, and given Siakam's about to turn 30, plus factoring in the additions of another three 30 plus year olds in recent years being Otto Porter Jr., Garrett Temple, and Thaddeus Young, Toronto's quietly become one of the NBA's most experienced teams. With Siakam getting to prove he wasn't the primary issue for the chemistry while being in a contract year, and poised been through it all vets in Dennis and Garrett entering the fold, you're going to see the vibes be a lot better for the Raps. If Scott Barnes commits the time to stretching out his frame before every game to the point where he's loose enough to avoid injury, given how he can land properly with traffic under the hoop, he should be fearless going downhill as much as possible. I've said it since he was drafted that he's got Giannis-esque galloping strides and force. Rack attacking whenever the door opens up is going to allow Scott the best possible chance to reach his full potential as there's plenty of career left for the rest of his bag from the perimeter to come around. I know Scotty's jumper is looking nice in the Rico Hines runs, but Ben Simmons can also look like a sharpshooter away from an NBA environment. In my opinion, Scotty has to realize his Adetokounmpo-esque player archetype, 
when it comes to him taking a high volume of shots from beyond the paint. How about you don't, ladies and gentlemen, Scotty do? Life is demanding without understanding, and only 27% of Scott's total shot attempts came from the paint in his sophomore year. In Giannis's second year, 50% of his shot attempts came from the paint. He would go on to become a finals MVP in the next few years. Even amidst the three-point shooting Steph Curry era, over 20% more of Giannis's shots came from the paint than Scott's did last year. Sad part about that? Barnes was 5% more efficient than Giannis from that area. The numbers tell you he should mix in the occasional J to keep the defense honest, but easily could be averaging over a 20-piece per game. If he was around the basket more instead of 5% more of his shots coming from 3 to 10 where it's tougher to knock down and work the same amount, that'd be a recipe for success. From there, it's about refining his post moves and more importantly recognizing the in most cases obvious advantage is from that area. Barnes has more than enough strength and reach to establish position, but he can't be afraid of the contact. He has to embrace it. In the past, he's been very hesitant to take it downhill. In one-on-one -on -one matchups, if Scott doesn't get past his man off the dribble, he has to take his defender into the post more instead of kicking it out as much as he does. Every pass has to come with intention, not desperation. That'll allow him to get a higher percentage of easier shots off with his ability to extend for bunnies around the cup. It'll also help him draw more defensive attention. Speaking of that, being 10 times better at drawing double teams would make him a higher IQ offensive weapon. Barnes recognizing his in-between game and perimeter shooting as a last case scenario would also help his consistency. Instead, Barnes has built his game around finesse, when in my opinion, it should be about power. More aggressiveness going downhill from Barnes has a chance to shift the landscape of not merely the Raps, but the modern NBA. No cap. However, the Raptors being ranked 25th by ESPN proves most experts aren't buying into Scotty's development. They don't believe he's willing or capable to fully realize his archetype is a downhill slasher. That, and they question his maturity level to be a stone-cold professional on a nightly basis. Expect that to add fuel to his fire, but he's got to make adjustments. Given his 7-2 wingspan, 99 overall dunk and rebounding attributes, this man can be leaps and bounds better than most of, if not any other point forward in the game, if he attacks more. Barnes needs to come to the conclusion that he's a primary slasher. It has to happen in year three. Since being traded from Portland in the Norm Powell trade, Gary Trent Jr. has been Toronto's most underrated player for the last three years. He's been top 11 in steals per game over the last two seasons and a 38 plus percent career three-point shooter. Efficiency tracked over 270 games with GTJ taking exactly 1,713 shots from beyond the arc. That means he's taken an average of 6.3 deep range shots per game. Key for Gary, is making the priority complementing the team's more trusted options. Making that a priority is more important for both Trent and Ananobi than it is for them to try and rack up flashy numbers for themselves. This priority will make spotting up and moving off the ball next to Siakam, Barnes, and Schroeder a point of emphasis that's easier to transition to when the first instinct for those effective weapons is to jack up a shot. But why do you think Toronto's being slept on? Let me know down below for a chance at next video shout out.